At the 2021 Russian Grand Prix, Ferrari introduced a new hybrid system onto one of its cars before the race weekend. And that got us here thinking that we, just, we should take a more detailed look at a Ferrari power unit. And we got that opportunity at the Italian Grand Prix last time out, where the Italian team let us crawl over one of their 2014 power units. I'm joined here by Craig Scarborough, and we're gonna just take a, a little stroll through some of the details on this power unit. And Craig, it was quite exciting for us to see this, wasn't it? It was, I mean, it's quite a nerdy thing, but what's quite surprising, Ferrari, historically an engine manufacturer that strapped race cars to them. Since 2014, in fact, since the old V8 era, they've never released any images or video of one of their power units. So this really is the first chance for us to have a proper close-up look at one of these engines. And yeah, there's lots of details that I missed back in the day that we can now see. Well, it's fair to say the 2014 Ferrari power unit wasn't a huge success. Conceptually, the team decided to engineer the power unit to be as small as possible so that the team could optimise the aerodynamics of the rear of the car. That was the initial size zero concept before McLaren had come up even with that terminology. They tried to make it as tight as possible, as small as possible, but that actually robbed it performance and actually, as I understand it, ended up with a power unit that was a little bit on the heavy side. However, there are still some really interesting features on this unit. And the first thing I want to take a look at is the charge air cooler, because this large section on the top of the V6 block, you can see the charge air cooler in the middle there, that's quite different to what anybody else in Formula One did. I remember seeing for this for the first time when the Manor team had its financial issues and a lot of parts got auctioned off. Well, that gave us an opportunity to see this. And Craig, I know you poured over one of these in great detail. Yes, I, I was at the, the Manor auction as well. And this is a really clever piece of packaging. Again, as you say, the Ferrari power unit packaging wise was really on the money. In terms of an engine, it really wasn't. So what you have is normally the air comes out of the, the compressor on the turbocharger, very hot. So you want to cool it down, make the air more dense, get more oxygen into the cylinders. And what you would normally do for anyone that has a, a fast road car is use an intercooler or a charge air cooler is the same thing. And normally that's just like a radiator where the air passes through and then air comes across from outside the car and cools that air down. What Ferrari have got and what the factory Mercedes team have also been doing all of these years as well is use a water intercooler. So what you have there is a standard intercooler with a water jacket on. So that is much smaller and that then means the radiator in the side pod that cools that water down is much smaller. So you don't have a side pod full of a massive intercooler. So it made the side pods a lot smaller. So the air came from the compressor, went through the bit here, then came back up, tilted round through the throttle body and then to these really constricted uh, intake plenums and when you look at the modern cars you can see one of the reasons why this Ferrari really was so far behind the times even back then. And that's one of the things we talk about that water jacket it sounds smaller but heavier in the centre of the car and that's quite up on the top of the V6 engine it's heavy raises the centre of gravity and that affected car performance but you talked about the turbocharger there a little bit and I thought we'd just take a look at it because the 2014 Ferrari turbocharger did raise some questions during the season and you can see it here just mounted at the back of the V6 block now this would have sat inside the leading edge of the gearbox bell housing and you can see the main chunks of it here and some of the ducting and the wastegates in there as well now one of the key things that ferrari discovered during this period that the exhausts aren't fitted on this car but when ferrari first started running this power unit they didn't clad the exhaust it was bare metal exhaust the only team in formula one to take that approach and they discovered it wasn't the best idea no, exactly. The exhaust actually came up over the cylinder heads and there was a massive wastegate, which again was another one of their technical issues and their conceptual issues with the car. Came up over here, met the wastegate, went into the turbocharger. The problem you have is if you have a bare metal exhaust, the exhaust gases passing through it start to cool, which means they start to shrink. So what you're not getting is that pressure at the turbocharger. So you now see teams, you know, quite significantly lag the exhaust, which doesn't do much for the metal inside because they run at incredibly high temperatures, but it does great for power production. So it was, they used initially a very simple exhaust trap, almost like something you would get from, you know, your kind of your local car, car accessory store. Teams now use something far more complicated with silica fibers and in canal cladding and stuff. So yeah, this was a key thing that Ferrari got wrong with this car. I mean, it wasn't all that different initially to the exhaust wrap that you can get exactly. for a motorcycle exhaust system. Yep. But Ferrari moved on from that pretty 
pretty quickly. But the exhaust also, by regulation, had to have a ballistic housing. These things spin round at significantly high speeds. And all of the other manufacturers, the other two power unit ma manufacturers, Renault and Mercedes, had fitted an additional ballistic shield around the turbocharger. Ferrari opted not to and engineered it into the compressor and turbine housing itself and there was a little bit of a debate about the legality of that but it went away pretty quickly. So looking at the turbocharger all hanging out the back of the V6 block it raises a question where is the MGUH? Well this was something that was widely speculated at the time because this is all new te technology to all of us. Uh, there was lots of speculation that all the compound turbochargers we've seen up to that point had the MGUH in between the compressor and the turbine. That wasn't the case here. You can probably just see in the V of the engine here some silver and that is the MGUH just sitting in and just rests up against the back of that intercooler that we saw. So you can see the packaging that Ferrari had to do to get all of this within the V of the engine to get that really narrow envelope that they wanted for the chassis. But it's again, it's more weight up high, which we saw as a problem. I thought we'd take a look here as well at how the turbo was designed. Now, we know that Mercedes and Honda use this split turbo concept with a compressor and turbine separated. But here you can see the compressor on the Ferrari, again, at the back of the block. And that's going to create thermal issues, isn't it? It is because you've got lots of heat from the exhaust and the turbine as well. And that will go straight into the, the compressor, which because you don't get quite as good cooling with a water intercooler as you would with a side pod uh, intercooler, that did equally have problems for Ferrari and it creates problems getting the airbox packaging and you can actually see the airbox comes down to the turbocharger here and then there's ducts that go up towards the roll hoop. Now, it's the similar story when you take a look at the, the turbine itself. That's the hot bit. That's the hottest bit of the turbocharger. No surprise that that is obviously hanging out the back of the block as well. But that's in really close proximity to various suspension components. Ferrari actually had to fit a heat shield between the, the, the turbine and those suspension components because, as I understand it, they started to have a few thermal issues with the properties of the damping changing through the race as the, those components started to get hot. Yeah, again, lots of things that the teams were learning at the time, uh, playing around. Equally, you have a, a carbon fibre gearbox. Doesn't really like getting very hot. And equally, the problem that they found, and was something that Ferrari eventually played about with as well, is because you've got so much hanging out the back of the engine, the gearbox has to have a really big arched section to reach around to the engine mounting points. And that makes it it's not quite as stiff because you've got no strength coming across the middle here on the gearbox. So that's something they had to play about with in subsequent years. And with this turbine like that, those weakest points would be exposed to all of that heat. Now, taking on a look at the engine as an overall part here. So it's mostly about the V6 engine here. There's something that I'm used to seeing on all racing engines. The current generation of V6s, the old V10s, the V8s. Where's the oil tank? Because normally it would be sitting right out the front of the block here in a little recess at the back of the monocoque. But with this design of intercooler, there's no space for the oil tank, is there? No, and this is what for me encapsulates some of the clever thinking that Ferrari did put into the initial design of this engine. And we're very much following what Red Bull had been doing with the Renault engine packaging, even back in the Kurs V8 days. And what they wanted is to have a cleaner front to the engine as possible, as little um, objects encroaching into the fuel tank area so that you can move the whole package forwards, which gives you that super slim Coke bottle. Uh, design which clearly Ferrari had so the oil tank which would normally be sitting at the front here is actually as you can see the carbon fiber at the back uh, sitting again amongst that hot turbine within the carbon fiber um, gearbox case so that was a bit of a packaging nightmare in terms of making it work in that position they subsequently have moved it uh, in fact the only thing that sticks out the front of this engine is just that little bit of the, the plenum and the high pressure fuel pump just sitting down there which meant the, the engine could be much much further forwards if you looked at this in contrast to the mercedes which had the split turbo you had the turbocharger on the front and then the trunking to get air into the turbocharger and then you had all of the oil tank and everything else and that meant the whole package had to be further down the wheelbase which wasn't quite as good for aerodynamics but turned out was much better for engine power. Well, that's something that McLaren have had to deal with in 2021 when they've switched from Renault to Mercedes power. Something else that we can't see in these shots, but it's only because it's not fitted, was the MG UK. Now, there was a lot of specu speculation about where that should be located, but it was actually ultimately quite conventional on this power unit. It was. Um, again, the speculation was that it was actually at the back of the engine. 
Um, and it looked, from looking at some of the fittings there, someone could have not understood that or misunderstood that. It actually sits just on the underneath of the bank of the engine here, driving via gears to the front of the crankshaft. So when that is producing its 160 horsepower, in addition to what the combustion engine is doing, that's driving straight through the crank, straight out through the powertrain. And that's pretty conventional for all of the cars. But the real excitement for me inside the Ferrari power unit, as with all power units, is actually inside the cylinder heads. Now the cylinder heads play a key role in not just the power unit, but also the whole chassis. That you can see these holes here. This is because the whole power unit is a load bearing structure in the car. It's part of the chassis of the car. This goes back to the Ford DFB era. They were the first to do it with the Lotus 49, create that full car monocoque structure. So the rear of this car, the rear of this block and the cylinder heads mount to the front of the gearbox so this becomes a fully stressed part of the car but inside those cylinder heads there's been a lot of clever technology and that's where we start talking about the development from 2014 right through to 2021. Now in the 2014 power unit there was a lot of work going on in the combustion chamber changing the shape of the top of the piston inside the valves inside that top of well the top of the well the combustion chamber itself to be honest. Now some clever stuff came along. Mercedes discovered it first. They started using pre-chamber ignition on their 2014 power unit. That gave them a huge advantage. Ferrari introduced it the year after this power unit in 2015. They called it turbulent jet ignition, which some people still refer to, but it's just pre-chamber ignition is really what you should call it. But since then, we've seen huge performance and efficiency gains on these power units, haven't we? Yeah, so you have to remember when these engines or power units were first introduced, there was a 30% reduction in fuel consumption demanded by the regulations and the limit in fuel flow and race fuel. So these engines use so much less fuel. Now this Ferrari engine back in 2014 was very conventional in terms of a turbocharged race car engine. It had conventional spark ignition, it really used a large wastegate and they opened the wastegate on the straights and just sent that exhaust pressure straight back out the back of the car, not trying to capture it with the MGUH in the way that other teams were doing. But as you say, pre-chamber came along and this is where it started to get really clever. And the problem you have is when you've got a combustion uh, area and you don't have enough fuel, it's very hard for that spark plug at the top to ignite all of that fuel completely and quickly. So with pre-chamber, what you have is the spark plug gets changed. Rather than just having the electrode and the outside of it, it has a little chamber added to the end of it, which fuel goes into. And you can get a very rich fuel mixture inside the end of the spark plug. So when the spark then happens, what you have holes in the bottom of this chamber that fire literally jets of flame, like a flamethrower, out into the very weak mixture inside the rest of the combustion chamber, which very quickly and very completely burns the rest of that fuel, which gives you really high efficiency and power. Ferrari lacked that in 2014, Honda initially lacked it, everyone now has pre-chamber and as you say uh, turbulent jet ignition as it was called which was the Marle technology that Ferrari still uses and actually is now starting to appear on road cars. If you think of the potential, if we could all have 30% better fuel consumption, we would have it. Um, but especially if you can keep the same power. So yeah, Ferrari had a lot of catching up to do and it really has taken this entire era of the sport for everyone really to get very close on power unit performance. Well, there is one more Ferrari iteration of power unit to come before this era of Formula One comes to its natural conclusion. The 2022 Ferrari power unit is allowed to be, by regulation, a completely new design. But some of the technologies from the 2014 power unit will carry all the way through. Some of the learnings and lessons, difficult lessons, frankly, for Ferrari with this 2014 unit will have a fundamental effect on the design of that 2022 power unit. And also, on the hybrid system being run by Charles Leclerc in the Russian Grand Prix.